Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, March 11th, 2015 Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. It's approximately 4 o'clock and for the record to show that all members of the Council's Committee is present. We do have some guests uh, with us as well. Uh, today's focus for the meeting is to discuss solid waste and related issues around solid waste in the Town of Scarborough. And we have several guests that include Mike Shaw, uh, who is our Public Works Director, uh, Kevin Roach from EcoMaine, and John Campbell from Waste Zero. Um, be presenting to us regarding pay as you throw. Uh, with that, uh, before we uh, get too far into this, uh, do you need a motion to approve the minutes from January 14, 2015? Move approval. Second. Thank you. All in favor. And I would like to uh, provide an opportunity for anyone in the public that would like to speak. If you can uh, come up to the podium, uh, state your name and address, and uh, provide us with your comments if you'd like. A couple of guests. Not seeing any, we'll just move forward and close public comment. And um, I'll turn it over to Tom for an overview and then introductions. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, we have a number of guests lined up. Um, this is a um, solid waste focused conversation. And I've asked Mike Shaw, who heads up public works and the solid waste uh, operations for the, for the town, to provide just some overview kind of uh, comments to put in context what you'll hear following. So without further ado, I'd like Mike just to kind of set the stage for what else you'll hear. Is that going to be? I'll make sure it is. We had it on. Um, hit video on the table. Mike and John, and while we're waiting, if you want to, if you want to come up here, you're welcome to join us up at the table. Did I say Mike? I meant Kevin. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. For some reason I looked at you and said, Mike. <laughs> Other than height, you kind of look alike. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about uh, what is essentially a, a, a very big piece of my budget. Um, so it's, it's always good to have a conversation around it. Uh, hopefully, if uh, when it comes to Recycling and MSW or municipal solid waste, if we're doing our job right, it, uh, it's kind of one of those things that the, the average citizen kind of takes for granted or is there in the background, knows that uh, on their appointed day they're going to get collected and it's going to go away. And, and uh, the next week comes and it happens all over again. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we strive for. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's pros and cons to that, I suppose. Uh, on the one hand, it, uh, can sometimes get out of people's uh, people's mind's eye as far as you know uh, extended efforts for recycling and so forth and so on. But, uh, so just a couple of things: uh, a, a, a comprehensive solid waste management program um, has quite a few components to it, and we'll go down through them. But uh, um, probably uh, one of the things is where where does the uh, where do the recyclables where does the solid waste go? Um, and, and probably there are probably a lot of folks out there that don't realize that they are, they are uh, as, as taxpayers and residents, they're an owner of a waste energy facility. Um, you know, Eco Main is a is, is a uh, is a waste energy and recycling facility that is uh, along with 20 other communities. We uh, we we are an owner of, of Eco Main, and uh, that uh, and, and also that uh, we have some e of Eco Main's facility. Uh, in Scarborough, within the borders, so, um, so we, we're, we're in the business. So we're, we we should have even that much more of a heightened awareness and uh, desire to do the right thing. I would think. Uh, one of the uh, some of the components of a good uh, solid waste management program are proper ordinances, and uh, to ensure that we are maximizing our our return to our facility, uh, we do have a flow control ordinance that ensures that all solid waste. Comes out of Scarborough goes to Eco Main. Uh, there are other places they can go to, but uh, uh, you know, those, those are uh, by ordinance uh, prohibited. And uh, it's a good thing because uh, uh, obviously the tons may have mattered to us, uh, we're a waste energy facility, and uh, also it's a proper disposal. We know that it's proper disposal when it goes to Eco Main. Um, another element of, of ordinance that we have is, uh, is a waste handlers agreement, and that's an annual. Uh, licensing fee process, licensing process where uh, anybody that operates a uh, disposal service in the town of Scarborough has to come in. They, they come into the town to the uh, town clerk, they go see Cody, and 
Cody in that uh, they, they, get a, they get a waste handlers agreement, and with that, we know what they have for equipment, who they are, where they're operating, and that sort of thing. So that's a very important piece. And then lastly, we're going to be talking about a budget, and I've, I've, I've broken it down into three pieces here that we'll, that we'll discuss in a few other slides. And, uh, but the total waste budget, my total waste budget in, in, the, in the public works budget is essentially $1.3 million. And so that's, that's, a, that's a lot of money. Uh, the good news is that uh, two or three years ago, I would have said that that's about the, the number I used to pass around uh, when someone asked what solid waste was in my budget. That's about 1.6 million. Well, it's now 1.3 million. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, and Kevin will expand on it even, even further as we go along. So, um, a little history on what we have today as a uh, as an automated curbside automated collection program. And um, it started in the spring of 2007. And uh, I know it started in the spring of 2007 because that was also uh, right about the time we were going to roll the 13,000 plus carts out. Uh, it was the weekend of the Patriots Day store. And I vividly remember coming in. We had about eight or 10,000 carts that were stacked up in the, in the backyard of DPW. They were no longer in the backyard. They were stacked up along the tree line. And so that was what I thought might not be an auspicious start to the program. Uh, luckily, I was wrong. It's been a very well-accepted program. And so currently, we have about 6,500 weekly stops. Um, our current curbside contractor is uh, Pine Tree Waste. And uh, they have been with us since the beginning and uh, um, have offered great service all, all through the time. Uh, very, uh, very accommodating and that sort of thing. Um, the automated program is also the first time that residents saw and had an opportunity to have curbside um, recycling collection, which was a huge deal. Um, until that time, we had a series of silver bullets or the re big recycling bins that you see at various locations, of which we still have three locations today. Um, but that was the only opportunity for, for folks to, to, to recycle. And so that was a you know a big a big piece of this was was to have that recycling component. And uh, you know as, as I say here prior to prior to the automated program we had uh, we had a we had a 19 percent recycling rate did not sell by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the first year after uh, we implemented the curbside automated program we, we peaked at 38 percent, which is you know was was a, was a good rate. Uh, since then, we've, we've, we've backslid a little bit. We're down to about 32% on an annual basis, plus or minus. 32.5% is actually the average uh, that we have right now. So I mentioned that there's three elements to the, to, to the solid waste program. Uh, here are two. is the MSW, the Municipal Solid Waste Collection, and then also the Recycling Collection. And this is specifically the curbside component. This is what this is the, the bulk of what that of, of what the cost is to the tune of 1.16 million dollars. And in the solid waste piece, uh, there's a curbside collection contract, which is with Pine Tree Services, and currently that is around 378 thousand dollars on an annual basis. Um, 6,500 stops. It, it's Scarborough is, geo, as, as you well know, geographically the large, large, large community, so it's a lot of miles. Tipping fee element is just that. That is a that, that's a per ton price that we pay over at Eco Maine to dump our trash, which then is uh, uh, incinerated and turned into electricity, which generates uh, revenue for Eco Maine for us. And uh, so that's that's uh, that's what that three hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars represents. Uh, we've gone from, uh, from a high when, when I first started uh, on the Eco Maine board. I sit on the Eco Maine board of eighty eight dollars a ton. It's now down to seventy dollars and fifty cents a ton. So um, that's a function of the financial health of Eco Maine, and that will be. Uh, I hope Kevin uh, takes takes the time to uh, really expand on that because that's that's a that's a real success story. It's a real success story that he has uh, he's been uh, he's been the leader of. Uh, plain and simple. Um, the other piece that you see there, eco main assessment, is zero dollars. Well, why would I put that in there? I mean, it doesn't cost me anything. That is another big success story. Uh, to the tune of uh, three, three hundred plus thousand dollars on an annual basis to uh, to, uh, to Scarborough. That is no longer my budget. 
And then on top of that, the, the automated carts that we do have, those carts are purchased by the town, they are owned by the town, they continue to be owned by the town, and they actually are assigned to the parcel, not the person. So in other words, if the Council of Bayby decides to move tomorrow and move someplace else in Scarborough, he doesn't take his carts with him. The carts stay with the parcel. Uh, we just recently, uh, within the last uh, within the last year, with the help of some staff from, uh, from Pine Tree, uh, uh, embarked on a uh, uh, RFID tagging program for the carts. And it's, it's an asset management tool for us. It allows us to know where those where those carts are, that they're associated with the right parcel. Uh, there is no personal information that is on there. I, you look at those. You look at the information that it, it gets. It, it gives me the cart serial number, the location. It does not tell me the name of anybody or anything like that. But those carts, uh, which were supposed to have a minimum 10-year lifespan, are going to last much longer than that. They're just fabulous, fabulous units, um, and recyclable in their own right when the time comes. So. You can see here, I've broken it out, it, and, and I budget, I, I budget uh, $14,000 a year, and what that is, is that is uh, uh, cart purchases for um, new homes, and then also uh, we repair a lot of the, a lot of the carts, a lot of the, they're repairable, and then uh, on occasion they do uh, just go beyond repair, so we need to replace them, so that's, that's what that $7,000 in, in this side and on the other side represents. Um, so, solid waste. Just the collection of the trash is a $780,000 expense on an annual basis. Uh, the recycling side of things is just that. Uh, you see that you see that there's another $378,000 there. You, it's broken out that way. Uh, that's the way it was bid. Uh, yet there is one truck that goes uh, goes around does the collections. It's a split hopper truck. I. Uh, uh, the, the, the first the first month or two, I got a lot of angry calls about saying, why am I bothering to sort this stuff when it's going in the same truck, going to the same place? And, and, and so uh, it, it took me a while to figure out what they were talking about, but then I realized it's, it's a split hop of trucks. So 60% of it takes the trash, 40% takes recycling, and that sort of thing. So that's, that was a, an education process for the general public, uh, as well as myself. And again, you see the annual car purchase here at, uh, at $7,000, and I just split it out between the two. Um, and real, really no, uh, no magic there beyond that. And so the, the curbside collection program is a $385,000 expense for us for recycling collection. Um, so that's, that's two elements of, of the program. And then a, a much smaller piece is, is what I've just kind of lumped as special waste disposal costs at, at uh, $130,000. Originally, originally we had uh, we, we had re we had thought that when the automated program came on board, we would do away with all um, the silver bullet or all the recycling collection points. And at that point, I think there were six or seven. There were six, and we had them up in North Scarborough and all over the place. And you know, we realized that it, it, it's we could probably get away with it, but, but there was a lot of interest from the general public to still have those. Uh, folks that are, uh, you know, small, uh, small home businesses that may have a little extra. Uh, we, they get a lot of use around the holidays um, and that sort of thing. So they, they continue, they, they continue to, to, pull a lot of, uh, to pull a lot of material out of the waste stream. And so they, they seem to be a value for us. And, and that's, uh, Okay, I skipped ahead a little bit. That's a $57,000 cost, and that represents um, the cost for the roll-off truck to haul the eco and dump and, and bring them back. Going back up to the top, you see a residential bulky waste transfer. Back in the early 90s, um, the, the old Holmes Road site closed up. That was a, that was a construction demo site where you could go to dump your construction debris and that sort of thing. It was never a trash dump. It was never, uh, so it was just construction demo debris. And that closed up. When that happened, we needed to do, to, as a community, we needed to do one of two things. We either, either needed to create our own transfer station, or we needed to find another outlet for that for the for residents. And that was when uh, Jack, then Jack Gibson approached the town of Scarborough and said, hey, you know, we're, 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 I'm willing to open up something called commercial recycling, uh, you know, and, and you can bring your stuff there. And that's what we'll do, and you don't have, you don't, you know, I'll, I'll go for all the environmental compliance and permitting and all that other sort of stuff. You guys don't have to do it. You know, take up valuable Scarborough land to do 
do it, and that sort of thing. And, and to this day, we continue to do that now with, uh, with John Allen of CPRC, Commercial Recycling Products, and, and that sort of thing. Um, that $60,000 represents um, a monthly $5,000 stipend that we pay uh, to for, 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 for his permitting compliance and reporting back to us and that sort of thing. He has to report back to us on an annual basis for our state for our state report to the, uh, to the planning office and that sort of thing. The other piece here is hazardous household waste disposal at six thousand dollars. That is something that we have been doing now for the better part of ten years. And that is an opportunity three times a year for residents to get rid of their hazardous household waste. And this is something that we've come, that we've, uh, we've done cooperatively with Bedford, Old Orchard, and Saga. And so, as a Scarborough resident, we hold one here in the in, in the uh, in the spring of the year, and then there's an opportunity again in the summer and in the fall. And those are either in Saga or Bedford, depending on which one you go to. And as a resident, you're allowed to go there and get rid of your your hazardous household waste. Um, in my opinion, probably one of the best programs we do. I mean, it, it just, it's that stuff that, you know, even even the, even, even the more conscientious people in the world, you know, they have that drain or they have this or they have that, some pesticides, you go, well, you know, it's not that much and they dump it. This is an opportunity for them to get rid of it. Uh, it's the right thing to do. And, uh, and, and incidentally, um, as the years went by, uh, it became part of, stormwater requirement that we have. It's a, natural, a, 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 a state permit that we have, and one of our commitments is to do some sort of hazardous household waste drop off. So it, it, it serves a dual purpose. And then uh, the miscellaneous slash special waste disposal at $6,800. Well, let me tell you, if we didn't have the silver bullets, and if we didn't have the hazardous household waste, and if we didn't have the bulky transfer items there, that $6,800 would be a lot more. Because what that really is, that is, uh, that's the actual cost of, of, of what, it, what it costs for us to dispose of material that we pick up throughout the course of a year as, as the public works, uh, you know. We still do things like uh, if, if, we have, uh, if we have a little bit of time in the afternoon and we're in between jobs, I'll send guys out to go, we, we say, hit the turnarounds, which is to go down to some of these side streets and lo and behold, there's loads of sheet rock. Uh, we have... Uh, we, we picked up, we, we, we received loads of asbestos that we had to leave in place and call the DEP and have them come take care of it and disposal and those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's always going to be that element of that sort of stuff. Uh, the number of people that we have here and for as many kind of clandestine spots as there are to go down, it's really not that bad. Really so, um, that's, that's what that, that's, that's that, that, that ends up being. So, um, that's, that's what I have. It's just, uh, just uh, I wanted to, to a quick sketch for you folks as to you know what we're spending and uh, what what, uh, what what that buys today uh, buys folks. And so that's uh, that. Any questions? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Great time. Thank you. Thank you. So with that broad view, we'd now like to dive a little deeper. Uh, Kevin Roach is here to talk about the eco main component of that and our involvement. So, Kevin. Important. 
because if the public doesn't know what it is that, you know, how to participate in programs, what happens to their waste, what happens to the recyclable materials, their likelihood of participating in these programs is not going to be as strong. Our foundation is built on the state of Maine's hierarchy, which is very similar to EPA's waste hierarchy. These hierarchies have been long established. First and foremost, reduce, reuse, recycling, then compost and digestion is now popular as well. Waste to energy, and then landfilling if there's no other opportunity for any particular piece of waste. We are governed by a board of directors, and we have 29 on our board, serving 20 communities. We have 53 member communities in all. So we have 20 owners, of which Scarborough is an owner community, and then the rest are either associate member communities or contract communities. Associate member communities, for example, would be SACO. They have a long-term, 20-year agreement with the rest of the community. We have everything down to very short-term contracts, where it could be one, two, or five years. So it really depends on the needs and the desires of each individual community. We go as far south as Hampton, New Hampshire. They're willing to participate in a company like EcoMain. And then as far north, probably one of our newer members is Augusta, but also Carmel and Newburgh. And so you might ask, well, why do we go to these faraway places? And over the years, what has happened is, with good recycling habits, along with the economy, we saw a pretty significant shrinkage, as the town of Scarborough saw, in the waste. And so that opened us up for, I guess, stretching farther for new sources of waste. And so that's why we've stretched further. Some of these members are just recycling members, and some of these members are both, and some of them are just waste members. We have three facilities, a single-sort recycling plant, a waste energy facility, and a natural landfill. And then in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, we take great pride in our outreach and educational programs, where we have a full-time environmental educator who goes out to the schools, and if the schools are willing, comes into EcoMain to tour our facilities. Because we feel that if they spend an hour with us, those folks are going to be doing our outreach for us, because they talk a whole lot about it. I wanted to just kind of give you some trends here. And by the way, this presentation is in the packet, if you wanted to follow along on the paper copy. But I just wanted to take you through a few trends in this presentation. And this is the Scarborough Municipal Recycling Tonnage over the last 10 years. And you can see in 2006, you know, up to 2008, that was the period that you went, as Mike mentioned, you went curbside and to single sort. And then it has leveled off since then, and we feel a lot of that is attributed to the economy. People are buying less. When they buy less things, they have less packaging. And people aren't reading the newspaper like they did 10 years ago either. So it's only natural that you're going to see a decrease in some of these things. And again, we attribute that to, you know, the general state of the economy. And the industry has seen this as a whole. It's just not in Scarborough. It's just not in Eco, Maine. But across the country, we've seen that. So the first slide was Scarborough. But what's the all the communities lumped together look like? And this is our 53 member communities all together. And you can see that we've increased recycling since 2005 by 100%. So that's pretty significant. A lot of that, you know, came with single sort recycling. Single sort recycling provided a more efficient way to offer curbside programs. And so it was these curbside programs that had a significant influence on that tonnage. And you can see in the last year, we picked up some New Hampshire tons. And that has had an influence, you know, from 2013 to 2014. New Hampshire doesn't have a bottle bill. So they, the material that comes in tends to be, you know, particularly volumized, but also weight-wise. There's just more there. Because you have all those bottles and cans included. In our program, this is what the material looks like. 60% of it is still paper. 25% of it is cardboard. The paper has changed over the last 25 years. When I got into the business 25 years ago, we were selling mostly newspaper. We still call it, for some reason, we still call it a newspaper pack. But when you look at it, you have trouble finding newspapers in it nowadays. It's a lot of junk.
junk mail, it's a lot of glossies, it's a lot of catalogs, um, and envelopes and things like that, um, and not nearly the amount of, of newspaper that there used to be in the mix. But, you know, it's still a significant portion. Cardboard is an interesting one because, you know, 20 years ago, if you asked me if cardboard was still going to be 25%, I would have said no. But, um, you know, with, with everybody getting home delivery of packages and things like that, there's a lot of cardboard out there, and, and cardboard has really maintained its share of packaging in, in the market. Um, glass has gone down considerably. There's not much left in glass except for, you know, beer and, and, and pickles <laughs> and, and a few other things. Um, but, what more uh, is there in life? <laughs> <laughs> so that has really changed. In the plastic, you know, plastic up there says 3%. Uh, plastic just doesn't weigh that much. Volume-wise, there's a whole lot more plastic out there, but um, it takes a whole lot of milk jugs um, to, to make a ton. So um, that's the mix there. And this mix is much different, as I mentioned, when you look at our um, customers in New Hampshire. Much different mix. You're going to see your aluminum shoot right up. So what's the value of the recyclable material? You can see, um, we were talking about this before um, the meeting, but you can see that um, it is volatile. And um, my experience you know, over the last 25 years is it's somewhat cyclical. Um, it goes up, it goes down, and um, my hope is, is that right now at $61, it's, it's a pretty weak market. Um, you're, you know, survival is, is the key at this point. Nobody's making any money on recyclable materials. $61 just doesn't cut it. And, um, however, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that you know, we were well over $100 a ton. So over at, you know, at $100 a ton, you're, you're making some money on that material, but certainly uh, not at $61 a ton. And one of the um, primary reasons for that um, that I just did want to mention, obviously it's supply and demand, but China has left the market. Their economy isn't strong, and, and they were one of the largest importers of scrap. And so when they fall off um, the market, uh, it has a, a, a dramatic impact on, on the price of recyclable materials, and that includes metals and, and, and paper and, as well as plastics. So plastics tend to follow the oil prices. So um, it wasn't that long ago that milk jugs Milk jugs in 1989, you had to pay somebody to come pick up milk jugs. These are the, the clear, natural color milk jugs. Um, and last year, they got up to uh, over $1,200 a ton. So we're talking, you know, we're approaching aluminum prices. And, um, and now they're less than half that today. And, and they basically came crashing down with, with the uh, fuel prices. Um, the next facility we have is the waste energy facility. We feel that waste energy plays an important role in our integrated approach to solid waste management. Um, with waste to energy, you get a, buy, a 90% re, uh, reduction in the volume of waste. If we didn't have waste to energy for the last 20 uh, years, our landfill um, that is half located in, in the town of Scarborough would have been filled up. Um, and we too would have been shipping our waste to faraway places. Um, and so that has allowed us to maintain our landfill that is only two miles from the, from the greatest source of generation. And um, not too many cities or towns um, can say that across, across North America. Um, most landfills now are, are located in, in faraway places. Um, waste energy also provides stability of the waste. Um, it, uh, it, it becomes an ash. Things kind of are held together in, in a landfill in ash form. It provides electrical generation. Um, and you'll see that the price of, of electricity is down, but we generate enough uh, electricity to uh, supply um, about 14,000 homes needs of, of electrical. And then um, recovery of metal. So if, if, if people aren't participating in the recycling program or they have an odd recyclable material um, that they know isn't included in the recycling program, if it does end up at the waste, we're pulling it out. And um, in addition to pulling it out at the plant, we're also doing some mining of the old ash fill at the, uh, at the um, landfill. And, and if you wanted to take a closer look at that, it's kind of cool. And I'd be happy to take you out there anytime you're, you're interested and available. Another trending graph, this is your um, solid waste tonnage over the last 10 years. And so, I mean, this is significant. 30% reduction um, over the last 10 years for the town. And, and again, I think um, the reasons here are twofold. I think dramatically speaking, it's the recycling. Um, but also, I think the economy has, is weighing in there as well. 
Um, owner community time. So collectively, the 20 uh, owner communities, actually it would be 21 owner communities, um, tons are down 26% over the last 10 years. I've been here for 11 years. Um, if you had asked me, if you had really asked anybody in the industry that we were going to see this kind of downturn in waste generation, um, I don't think any of us could have predicted that. And we knew that recycling was going to play a role, but here it's also, you know, uh, you know the, the economy definitely is, is playing a role here. We're not just seeing it here in our communities. Again, this is another trend that, with, that the industry has seen as a, as a whole. Um, commercial waste time. So this is kind of interesting, you know, as opposed to the last slide that looked at just the residential tons, this looks at commercial tons. So, you know, the com commercial tons, we've seen, you know, a dramatic decrease when, when the economy went south. Um, it did recover sooner than residential tons did, and um, last year we actually saw a 9% increase um, in commercial tons. So this is the tonnage that is coming from, from the business sector. Um, the turbines. So we do generate electricity um, from the waste that is processed at the waste energy plant. The turbine actually goes down um, for, um, for uh, repairs about once every five to seven years, and this is the year that we'll be taking down our turbine, so it's a major event. Um, and we'll actually send that turbine um, on a truck to western Pennsylvania um, for, for repair and fine-tuning. Um, it'll be sent back and, and put back into place, and hopefully that, that turbine will turn for another uh, you know, five to seven years. Um, and it's been turning for, you know, for um, 25 years since the plant started. So here's our electrical prices over the years. And again, kind of like the commodities market um, that I showed you earlier when it deals with recycling, this too is, is somewhat cyclical. Um, and, and over the last, you know, this last year, basically, we're down to $47 a ton. Um, again, not a real um, profitable area for, uh, for us. Um, however, what else are you going to do with the waste? So, um, better to process it through waste to energy than to, to landfill it. And you can see um, we, hit, we hit a high in 2010 of $78, ton, uh, this is per megawatt hour. And um, in, in comparison, back in the um, 90s, you know, you're, you, were, you were seeing prices much higher than this because um, the, the industry was subsidized. We lost our subsidy in 2000 when the, when the industry was deregulated, and, um, and so we've been basically selling on the market, whatever the market is. And we do a one-year, we, lately we've been doing a one-year contract, high bid. In this case, we go for high bid. This is a picture of our, our landfill, and, and I think this is interesting for the town because half of our landfill um, is located in the town of Scarborough. The other half is located in South Portland, and actually, interestingly enough, you have to drive through Westbrook in order to get to our site. So um, we're, we've got all three communities involved here. Um, the dividing line, interestingly enough, you can see, see the two sections that are covered with plastic, and, and the northern section there, the top section, is South Portland, and then the Scarborough line basically runs between the two sections there, and the southern um, part is in, in, um, in Scarborough. Landmass-wise, a much larger portion, if you include the entire site, is, is in Scarborough. Um, and we do pay a payment in lieu of taxes of about $72,000 a year to the town of, of um, Scarborough. We also pay that to the city of South Portland. Uh, and we also pay a pilot pay payment to um, the um, city of Port Portland. Just kind of comparing um, in Asheville, I talked a little bit about the stabilization of a waste. Um, this compares a, a landfill, a raw waste landfill, with a, an Asheville. And, and because this is located in Scarborough, I think it, it's really close to what the issues you would be faced with um, if you didn't have, if we didn't have an Asheville. We do sometimes take waste. So, for instance, in the summertime when we get additional waste in, we do take that waste out to the landfill for short-term storage. Today, actually, and over the last month, we've been bringing that back because what happens is waste streams dry up in the middle of winter, and so rather than turning off a boiler or closing down, we actually store the waste for a few months and bring it back in the wintertime when we need it. Um, and so you can see that the ash product that you're landfilling is, is much easier material to deal with, uh, to manage, than the waste itself. And then if you ever have to mine it or dig it up, Again, a much easier project than, than going into a raw waste landfill. Um, also with landfilling, you know, raw waste, you're, you're dealing with odors, um, you're dealing with gas, um, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a harder uh, material in general to deal with. Recently, we actually dug up some
some old waste because we have over the years had to landfill, especially early on when um, the waste stream was larger and we had some difficulty with startup. But um, last year we, we kind of wanted to do, we had to do some remediation of the old landfill anyway, so we, we needed to dig some stuff up. So I was able to participate um, in this mining project and, and actually sorted through some of this waste. And these are two examples of what we found, an open Ruffles potato chip bag from 1992. And the, the chips were crushed, um, but they still look like chips. Um, that paper, if you, if you can look real closely, that's from the election, I think in 1992, Ross Perot was running. <laughs> that paper was saturated uh, with, you know, it was totally wet but you could peel it apart and you could read every single page. So in a landfill setting, you don't get all that much degradation. You're going to get some degradation, but this is, this is proof um, that not all the waste does decompose. The extreme that I didn't show here is chicken breasts. So we actually found whole chicken breasts from 1992 that still could be identified as chicken breasts. So landfills, what they do do is a good job with storing the waste. Um, and in other sections of the landfill, you, you couldn't identify material. So it's, it's variable depending on um, the, you know, what's happening in, in certain sections of the landfill. Um, I mentioned earlier about our commitment to outreach. Um, this is key. We do a, an absolutely phenomenal job with getting, reaching a lot of people. Um, this year, we reached uh, 6,500 people personally, individually. This isn't just through TV, this is to radio, this is actually talking to that person or bringing them into the facility. And as I mentioned, um, the key to that is if you spend an hour with us, you're going to be talking about solid waste management for a very long time. Um, now, really, this gets into these next three slides, really get into the meat of uh, some of the finances that uh, I think Mike introduced. The first one is, is the um, tipping fees. So last year, we reduced the tipping, tipping fee by 20%. So we're at 70 50 which is a pretty competitive rate for, um, for a tipping fee um, in, in this market. And you can see for quite some time we're at 88 and that's when we had a lot of debt. We no longer have that debt. We're debt free and, we were, um, and the board made it a priority to, um, to provide financial relief to our owner communities. Uh, assessments. Uh, we had a pretty large assessment and this kind of took care of what the tipping fee didn't take care of. Um, and, you know, our communities are finally being rewarded after a number of years, but, you know, the debt service took us a long time to pay off, and, um, but now that facility is running without the debt and, and at a reduced value. So this past year, um, we actually were able to uh, provide communities with a rebate. Um, it was $1 million that was split up amongst our owner communities, and um, Scarborough's piece of that was $110,000, $111,000. Um, so each year we're going to look at that. This year might be a tougher year for us because uh, the stars have aligned, power prices are down, recycling markets are down, and so we might not have that million dollars to provide. We like to carry reserves, and the reason why we carry those reserves is because our communities have said, you don't have control over the recycling markets, you don't have control over the electrical prices, but you can't come back to us for more money. And so we have to have some more reserves set aside so that when we see these changes in the market that we're not going back to our own communities to, uh, to make up the difference. They just can't, they can't do that. So that's been a priority over the years. Um, for, for specifically for the uh, town of Scarborough, these are assessments and tipping fees combined. Um, in 2015, this does include the rebate. Um, so that's a 73% reduction since 2011. Again, um, that the rebate is, is something that the board of directors will look at each year and, and see if it's something that they can um, give back. So in conclusion, um, really the message that I got from our board of directors and specifically our, our finance committee was providing financial relief to our owner communities had to be front and center, had to be our number one priority. And I think we've, we've been successful in making it a number one priority. You can see the numbers in 2011. Assessments were, were $4.7 million. Um, 2015, a $1 million rebate I mentioned. Tipping fees went from 4.2 to 3.4 uh, million in revenue. So there's the total. Um, and obviously we sit on the other side of the table, um, but that 73% uh, community, our, our owner communities are, are it, it did take some time um, to, to realize these benefits, but I think they're, they're realizing now, um, they're, they're glad they're in. And that concludes my remarks for this afternoon. Excellent. Questions? I, I have a couple, Kevin. Um, so I'm fortunate enough 
to sit on the board now along with Mr. Shaw, so I do appreciate the work that you give. Um, and it's exciting to see the growth of the organization and you as well. Um, you focused on one of the challenges, which is the economic cycles of pricing and whether it's electricity or recyclables. Um, can you talk to, I know that you're faced with some upcoming capital investment issues um, as, that's pretty significant, as well as um, if you can remind at least Scarborough what our, uh, um, what the agreement is for the land closures. I believe there's a, like in 15 years or 18 years, where there's going to be a significant cost to the town as a result of that. Can you kind of cover that a little bit for me? Sure. Um, so capital improvement. Um, the board, um, about 10 years ago, uh, made it a, a priority at that time to uh, improve availability of the boilers, improve, improve capacity utilization, improve our performance, basically. And um, what was happening was when we ran out of trash, we were just running at reduced load, but yet we had the same amount of expenses. And so they made a commitment to, number one, um, make sure that we prospect for enough waste to keep the boilers going at full capacity, and number two, reduce downtime. And, and so we've made those capital investments over the years to really make sure that, our perform that the, um, the, the boilers are optimally performing. And um, performance has been, has been really outstanding, and I'd be happy to share those numbers with you. Going forward, yes, I mean, we have to continue. The cheapest way out um, is, is to landfill. I mean, every year, you know, the board is looking for ways to reduce rates. And, you know, I, I can come to you and I can reduce rates very quickly over the next five years by disclosing the waste energy plant and just landfilling everything in the landfill. But that would be short term, because as I mentioned before, we too would be shipping waste to faraway places very soon. And, and so um, that, that the waste energy uh, facility has served us well. We hope that it will continue to serve us well. Um, but we do need to continue to put improvements into that facility in order to maintain the performance levels that we're seeing today. And so this year, you know, for example, we'll be proposing to put $5 million into that boiler to make sure that we can continue uh, the performance uh, measures that we'd like to see. Um, we also know that, um, you know, in the future that we'd like to improve pollution control performance as well. And, um, and that's going to take an investment. And um, one of the things that we've looked at is, is a fabric filter. Um, other people call it a bag house, almost like a vacuum cleaner bag. We have uh, electrostatic precipitators now, and we're looking at uh, the possibility of converting over to a bag house. You know, a bag house or, or a fabric filter is, is, is about a $17 million investment, so it's not something that comes cheap. But we want to make sure that we're protecting the environment, protecting our neighbors, and, and, and performing at a very high level. Um, and so that's one of the things that, the things that the board will be looking at sometime in the future. Um, the EPA is, is, is reconsidering a max rules, a maximum achievable technology rules that they looked at in 2008 and took a, took a break from for a while for a number of years and now they're reintroducing some of those rules and, and talking to the industry of what's it going to take to see some continuous improvement. Um, and then finally on the liability side that you mentioned, um, yes, there is a, um, there is a, liable, a reserve that has been set up um, over the last few years um, to prepay the landfill closure. Um, we've never been able to fund that reserve um, because of the costs associated with debt service. Now that we've uh, seen this, this relief in our budget, um, we're putting uh, money this year, it was uh, almost a million dollars aside, into this account to, to allow that money to sit in that reserve so that when we're ready to close, close a section of the landfill or the whole landfill, that we have the money um, to do that up front and we don't have to bond so much or, or perhaps maybe not even bond any of it. Um, we feel that today um, our communities are generating this waste. Why should future communities have to pay for burying uh, our, you know, the waste that's being generated today? So that's the kind of idea behind that. So we don't leave that, that cost for uh, future generations. Thank you, Chairman. The reason why I mention it is because um, things are looking great, but there's future pieces that we have to take into consideration because while we might not have an assessment today, with the liability of the debt that might may be incurred as well as with the landfill, we have to be careful and it's always better to plan out 10 years rather than just one. That's right. And our finance committee has a five-year plan. Uh, we actually extended out to 10 years, but the five years is the most accurate. And, uh, and, and they look at it regularly. In fact, they'll be looking at it during this budget cycle. 
and then they'll look at it again in the fall, and, that, and usually it's in the fall when they make their recommendation as to uh, what, the, what the tipping fees and the assessments should be. And, and just, for, just to mention, for us, the reason why I bring it up is that we're trying to move our town and community. Usually finance committees of the council really look at a one-year perspective. Here's what I have in front of me. We go line item by line item and don't really take it out to the three-year mark or five-year. And so that I think this is a great transition into that new approach. So just, uh, just a short term question. You mentioned that the turbines going offline during the summer months. Is that a long process and what happens? Should we anticipate if that's offline so it's not producing electricity? But that's going to have an impact on cost the next budget year? Is there a way to estimate what that might be? I mean, is it offline a month or is it offline? Sure. Month? Um, we will actually continue to process waste. We just won't be generating electricity. So um, the, the we'll still get the 90% reduction. We'll still be generating ash. Um, the turbine will be off for about five or six weeks, starting okay. April, starting the first of April. Um, and you know, the, the quicker you know we can get it back. Um, obviously, the better. Um, you know, hopefully, there's nothing wrong with it. Seven years ago, when we sent it out, we got the turbine back, and the um, generator rotor ended up uh, causing us havoc. And we had to send that out. Um, and we're not planning to send the generator ro rotor out. The performance has been good, but when you take it apart, and, and you know, you never know what you're going to see. And so it's kind of like our boilers. Um, we go into our boilers hopefully just once a year. We do have downtime during the year as well if we have an emergency shut shutdown or, or a problem with them. But for the most part, we go in them once a year to do all our work. And you just don't know what's happened inside the boiler over the last year. Um, sometimes you see some surprises in there. And uh, But we have a pretty good, you know, after 25 years, we have a pretty good handle on what happens in, inside the boiler. So, so the, the, le the offline electrical loss of revenue is not going to be as significant. We budgeted for it, um, and you know, right now with our with this new contract being down, um, the value of the electricity is, is pretty low at this point. So, um, you know, we didn't purposely go down in in um, January when the price was over a hundred dollars a ton, uh, under, over a hundred dollars a megawatt hour. Um, so we've taken the we, we've taken the weakest month and, and planned the, the, the outage um, when um, prices weren't as high. Um, so it, it doesn't always work out perfectly, um, but we usually at the in-between seasons are when prices are, are fairly low. So this is when we usually do our outage. We don't do it in the middle of winter, and we don't do it in the middle of summer. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate it. Thanks. And if, if you ever do want to come out and take a look. Um, whether it's the landfill or, or any facilities, we'd be happy to take you around. So, thank you. Yeah, the, the tour is impressive. So, if you have an interest at all, it's uh, it's really something to see. So, you've heard, you know, Mike kind of painted the the picture, the broad brush stroke. Uh, Kevin's giving you some real specifics on um, the uh, recycling and also waste disposal end of things and how the Scarborough is uniquely tied into that operation, not just as a user but an owner. And what we thought might be interesting to talk about the third piece of this uh, puzzle, if you will, and that's the, um, well, I should take a step back. You know, just, just recently, in 2007, we instituted this single source curbside recycling program, and by all accounts, at least through my office and me as a customer, it works beautifully. I think residents have come to really uh, expect it and enjoy it and, and, um, and participate, as evidenced by fairly good recycling rates. Um, yet, in, in making that choice, we added about an $800,000 cost to the taxpayer. Um, you know, this is uh, essentially fully supported and underwritten by tax dollars. And so I think it's only reasonable to have a conversation, is there a way to help, one, increase recycling further and potentially um, uh, defray or offset some of those expenses through a pay-as-you-throw program. Um, and I happen to think a user fee-based system is some of the most equitable way of, of uh, approaching things. So what we'd like to do today is have Waste Zero um, here today just to give us a bit of a primer on these programs and maybe some specifics how it might work here in Scarborough. Okay? Great. I might as well. Uh, sure. Thank you. Good afternoon. John Campbell. I'm one of the uh, co-owners of Waste Zero. Uh, thrilled to be here. We work with 800 cities and towns across the United States. We're the fastest growing private company in the United States. We'll grow by about 50% this year. We'll grow by about 30% last year. Uh, after
after being in business for 25 years. One of the reasons that we're growing so quickly is that cities and towns are, just as, as Tom uh, suggested, are looking for what's next. They're, you happen to be in an absolute terrific situation. And if you're having, this is all I do. I talk to councils and finance committees, and this is a very good news discussion. And to their credit, this team is saying things are working well. We have contractors that are, that are doing their job, we put a great infrastructure in place. What's next? How can we be forward looking in improving our system? And, uh, and so we're pleased to offer a couple of ideas. By way of background, we work uh, not only with 800 cities nationally, but with 44 cities and towns here in Maine. 31% of the population of Maine has adopted a unit-based pricing program. I'm pleased to tell you more about that. The rate at which that is happening is accelerating. Uh, for example, in Eco Maine, about maybe even more than half the volume of recycled material comes from a waste zero pay as you throw community at this point. So we're major contributors. We, we, I like to say we punch above our weight uh, in terms of contributing to recycling because we can't go, uh, no matter how excellent the service is at the curbside, we can't go into people's kitchens and, and help them to, to, to make them to, uh, help them to make the decision to use the recycling bin. We can't coerce them to maybe engage in something as radical as backyard composting or to put those textiles that could go to goodwill uh, you know, into the goodwill bin rather than throwing them in the trash. To make those kinds of changes, we really need to provide, we found, a financial incentive. And we've gotten extremely good at it. So I'm sensitive to time here this afternoon, so I'm going to suggest that what you have there in front of you is a long version. And you're, you're welcome to look at it. I've shortened it considerably so that we can uh, hit some of the highlights for you. Uh, and I believe I've, I've covered most of this. One of the things that's important to know about us is uh, all of the programs that we've put in place as a company where we've designed and implemented it are still in place. So a big part of our success as a business has been to make sure that we have a partner community because we'd like to maintain that 100% uh, success rate. Uh, if I didn't say it across uh, across Maine, it's a 45 percent reduction we've achieved. Uh, and most of those communities that we've gone into have already had recycling at the curbside. So it's a reduction beyond that which they've already achieved. Just uh, very quickly across the United States, most people have access to recycling at this point. Okay? So most of America looks like Scarborough. They have recycling bin at the curb relatively easy access to recycling and still we send 59 billion pounds of paper, 63 billion pounds of plastic, 6 billion pounds of aluminum to our landfills or waste to energy facilities and they're not all as nice as uh, and, and well run and, and forward thinking as eco mains. Okay? So essentially when those individual residents and consumers make a decision to put those things in the trash instead of in the recycling bin when we're already running a truck by their house and paying $387,000 to do that, that's a real shame. We've made it about as convenient as we can. So we'd like to try to change that behavior and divert that material to Kevin's MRF, save money, rather than having it go uh, into the uh, waste to energy facility. The reason that we have this problem, despite the fact that we have availability of single stream recycling, is that we haven't, in solid waste, created the right economic incentives for residents. Uh, and we have a lot of data on this point, reams of it. It's really, at this point, there is no question about the impactfulness of creating a financial incentive for a consumer. It works every single time, and we can predict very clearly what the impact will be. So, you know, if you look back in time, I love the fact that you're taking a, sort of a, a long view here. Cities and towns used to, many of them used to generate and sell electricity. They provided sewer services. You know, we, we, we provided all kinds of services. Utilities provided those services. And every single model that was on an all-you-can-eat sort of basis, which is what you have here in Scarborough, you can put as much trash at the curbside, and thank goodness, they're gonna, you're going to make it go away, whatever it costs, okay? It costs you about $380,000 to make it go away and to dispose of it. So. Uh, our waste reduction programs, uh, again, having done this for 25 years, we, we've done it all. We run hundreds of tag and sticker programs. We've weighed the trash. We've tried everything. 
the intervention that is most effective is to put the trash in a, in a bag with the town seal and to put that bag inside the automated container that's at your curbside. Okay? So no change in infrastructure. That bag that you're seeing sort of sitting by itself would go right into your existing container. We mount a camera in the hopper of the truck. Uh, the, the folks at Pine Tree and Casella are extraordinarily good professional haulers. They'll have no problem with this. And then the recycling continues to be free. And we want people to fill that up. And we also want them to be thinking about, again, because people are smart, how else can they approach waste reduction in their household? You don't have to, uh, to do a lot of work. People find a way to change their behaviors, and they find that way actually very quickly. Uh, so, again, uh, Tom and Mike and others can go through a process. We were written up in Maine Townsman in December. They asked us to profile four communities. Uh, again, there's no question about the waste, redu waste reduction results that will follow implementation of a program. They're dramatic and they're permanent. Okay, so we have many communities. I visited uh, two communities in New Hampshire yesterday that have had their programs going for more than 20 years. And they continue to reduce their municipal solid waste over time. So the programs, once they're in place, essentially from a budget standpoint, you eliminate the transfer from the general fund to solid waste, period. It's done. It's never for your folks that will follow on budget committees in Scarborough. They don't have a solid waste discussion. It's paid for in the fairest possible way with a, uh, with a unit-based system. And, uh, and it minimizes cost at the same time that transfer takes place. It's, it's the change process that people are afraid of. Okay? It's the, any kind of, anytime you change something as sacred as solid waste, you're going to have a long discussion about it. But the good news about it is that it's going to do exactly what this chart suggests. It's going to drop dramatically, and it's going to keep dropping and be fixed forever. We as a company have found that our job is to make sure that the program is successful. And like anything else, running a successful program involves lots of logistics. It involves being prepared. It involves a lot of communication. And so when we select a partner city, we're all in. And so making sure, you know, making the bags, which again, we've been doing for, for 25 years, printing them, making sure they go into the supermarket, collecting all the revenues, making sure the check gets to finance by the sixth of the month every month so that you know, we don't have a budget shortfall in a given month. The accounting, the inventory control, that's old hat. We've been doing that for over 19 years. And, and again, do it hundreds of times a month, uh, like clockwork. The thing that we've added more recently in the last three years is a, is a capability around community support. Because you have to engage the community. You have to go out and explain, look, we have a choice to make. I'm gonna, you know, essentially, this involves cities and towns telling the truth. Right now, we bury it in the tax bill. <laughs> Good as, it, good as these numbers are, they're still they're buried in the tax bill, and you have a choice around taking it out of the tax bill and and uh, and putting it into a structure where it's where it's more fair. That educational process is something that we support very well. Talking with newspapers, helping to engage around the launch, and uh, and those results are very successful. So you see places like Kennebunk where they had a public discussion uh, just two weeks ago, and the newspaper covered it. They said, should we get rid of this user fee and put it back in the tax bill? And for three hours, people came, residents came and stood at the microphone and said, no, keep it the way it is. It's working. I'm throwing away almost no trash. I'm recycling everything. We've gotten through this big change process. So once it happens, you never go back. Our job is to make sure that it launches more easily and more smoothly, and we've gotten uh, very, very good at that over time. Um, so just to... Uh, uh, give you a thought around what happens. This is some polling data, which you can look at in more detail at your leisure. At the end of the day, uh, a year from now, if we were to launch this budget cycle, which may or may not happen, uh, a year from now, when we asked your residents, did you find this to be effective in changing your behavior, which, good as it is, I mean, you, your, your solid waste disposal uh, rate is pretty much flatline. So you, you had a dramatic drop in 2008. It's pretty much stayed the same since then with some minor changes, people are going to tell you, you know what, I groused and grumbled when you told me I was going to have to pay for my trash, but I've totally changed my ways. And, and people become almost, uh, you know, they have a sort of a religious fervor about how they've become a partner. And so uh, the favorability ratings, the rate at which people are reelected, 
all those things, things that go through people's minds, they're all good. They're all positive. And, uh, and it's just very interesting. Every year we do this poll, and every year the numbers get better, especially now when you have a third of the population of the state doing it. Our response in public meetings is almost always, I knew this was going to happen, I just wasn't sure when. Okay. And so the sooner you do it, the sooner you get, the, the in your case, the $700,000 out of your budget in the savings. So you'll see data in there around the breakdown of the 31%. About 70% uh, of these people work with us. Uh, they're all over southern Maine. We're expanding. We're getting quite a bit of interest from all over the state now. I think the light bulb's gone off. By 2017, 2018, we'll have more than 50% of the state of Maine on unit-based pricing or pay as you throw. And they will all use pretty much the model that we described. If you're in a, in, in a city or town with north of 10,000 people, okay, in a 1,000-person town, all bets are off. Um, so the program results, uh, you know, I look at you, you have 579 pounds of, of trash per person uh, that you throw away in Scarborough. Uh, our average for pays you throw community that's eco-main is less than 300 pounds of trash per person. So I, I would say, you know, just be confident. You have a lot of room to run and to reduce the tons that would, uh, that would be subject to the $70.50 um, uh, fee. And we do have a lot of room to run also in terms of recycling. But at this point, you know, the real, the real name of the game is frankly about waste reduction and, uh, and finding the ways even beyond recycling that, that people can make a difference. In terms of financial impact, uh, we would forecast at a minimum $480,000. That's if you achieved the average that we've achieved in Maine at uh, 45%. If you didn't reduce waste by 45%, it would be unusual, but if, if, you, if you achieved a reduction of, say, 35%, you'd actually end up with more revenue, okay? The savings is based on the, the just calculating in a straight line the $70.50 rate times the 44% reduction. If you didn't reduce at that rate, but instead a little bit less or a little bit more, we, we change that number. But this is a very good ballpark estimate uh, of program impact, uh, assuming that um, Scarborough implements with exactly the same infrastructure that you have now. And this would be net of all of the costs to communicate, to launch the program, to do everything. So there's not, it's not as if there's some other uh, you know, set of funding that's required. It's, it's, it's all accounted for here. Uh, from, a fin from a financial impact standpoint, it's very significant in terms of budget impact. From an environmental standpoint, frankly, for Scarborough, this would be the single most impactful change now that you've done single stream curbside recycling for the next, you know, for, for, for the foreseeable future, let's call it the next 25 years. This is the, frankly, the only thing uh, that's going to achieve any magnitude of environmental impact. E even, frankly, uh, when we compare environmental impact to LEED certifying all the buildings, putting solar panels on every municipal rooftop, you really won't come close from an environmental standpoint to sending that material to Kevin's material recovery facility and recapturing uh, those, those, um, those rates. And so, you know, we're, we're thrilled to answer more questions about how it all works. I'm sensitive to time. I've got, you know, a little bit of data in here about, um, about eco-main communities, but I'm, I'm Tom uh, and, and uh, members of the council, I, I would leave it to you, given the, given the hour, to, to uh, Ask any questions you might like me to answer. Uh, where are you based? Where are you based? We're actually, uh, we have an office in Portland that we, and Sarah, who you know well, uh, I believe, Sarah used to work here. Uh, Sarah would be the program manager, ironically, assigned to Scarborough. So when we launch new programs, Sarah is our point of contact for our main communities. So all those 44 that we manage today, at the end of the day, She's, uh, she's in charge. We also have a regional office that is in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and then our national headquarters is in Raleigh, North Carolina. The, uh, the uh, individual, it's really just individual building by the purchase of a bag. That, it's so simple. You yep. just go through the line in Hannaford and mm -hmm. you pick up a bag and, and you put it on the shelf and when you need it, you start to fill it up and... Councilor Donovan, the, the secret to success is that you limit change. Uh, the pine tree 
containers remain exactly the same. The collection is exactly the same. The, you go to the Hannaford's to buy grocery bags today. You, today you pay about $24 a year on average a household just to buy trash bags. Okay, the consumer data tells us. Now what we're saying is you're going to pay for collection and disposal based on how much you actually put at the curbside. And the way you're going to do that is with a prepaid Scarborough bag. And so people, uh, so the incentive is purely that people say the less bags I put out, uh, uh, the better off I am financially, and therefore they are more conscious of separating waste uh, and recyclable material. It, 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 it is that, that, it is that simple. It's behavioral economics, it's incentives, and it works quickly and, and beautifully and perfectly. And, and our neighboring communities, they're already involved in this, or? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, where, like, is Portland and? Portland's been running a program. Portland's, uh, Portland's program's been wildly successful. Uh, they have um, been running their program since, I believe, 1998? 99. 99. Uh, and they've, uh, they've gotten their per capita waste to about 275 pounds per person as compared to year 579. There are other differences that are important, but frankly, Portland today would, would generate twice the waste that they generate per capita just compared to peer cities their size had they not put pays in their own place. Do you ever see any differences between one town from another? I would think every town would be about uh, equally conscious about saving money. So if the incentive is the same, I would imagine from city to city or town to town, it would be the same. Or are there other differences that come into play? It's a, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating thing. I am a data geek, as is my partner. We have WASAP, which is our normative database where we collect data nationally, and uh, we implement, for example, in cities where the median household income is as low as thirty thousand dollars a year, and we implement in communities where the median household income is over a hundred thousand dollars a year. The thing that's absolutely remarkable about this program is it's going to cost the resident about $6 a month now to pay for, for th throwing away their trash on average. It really, that waste reduction uh, number really hones in at, at between 42 and 45 percent almost every single time regardless of the demographics. In this case, what's great about Scarborough is you've already set the table for success. Very often when I'm having a conversation with the community, I'm worried about do we have adequate containerization for the recycling material? Do we have a, a thoughtful uh, staff? Do we have all the things that we're going to need to make the program successful? All of that is done. So in Scarborough, we literally, I mean, we brought up Fall River, Massachusetts, which has 90,000 people, and 40% of the population doesn't speak English in six weeks. And we cut their trash by 43%. Okay, we put $4 million back in their budget. They'll never go back. Scarborough, literally, if you said, if we didn't have to worry about politics, if you said, this sounds great, John, let's make this happen, okay? In a month, one month, I could bring Scarborough up. By the time we got to August, your waste would be cut by 40%. It's amazing. Uh, so it, it's all about, at this point, the political process, the public conversation, and people understanding the change. The change will work. Better. What have towns uh, uh, raised as the most common complaint about going from the old system to this new system? Well, the, the, the complaint, of course, on the part of a resident is they believe and rightly so, that in their tax bill today, they're paying for the service because you've taken the $1.3 million that Mike has proposed or, or whatever amount you feel is, is, is justified. You put it in the budget and you fund solid waste through the general fund, which is the way we used to do water. So it's going from free to a charge. Correct. And so that, that's the base of the complaint. Anything else? I mean, that's, that's pretty clear that that's pretty people cool. would say, gee, I, now I'm paying for something I got for free before. That, that is by far the biggest complaint. Now, the fears are, will we have illegal dumping? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is a fear that at the, uh, if what's great is, again, you have people that are plugged in. At the Maine Municipal Association meeting in October, we had 25 of our 44 partner communities, and there was a lively discussion really that we weren't part of where, where one community, a sizable community, said I'd never do pay as you throw because I don't want to have illegal dumping. Twenty, I think 20 of the 25 
communities that have done this. Again, people get excited because they've done something pretty amazing when they've reduced their waste by this amount, jumped on this uh, individual and said, we haven't seen any of that. What are you basing that on? Where have you seen it? And, and, and they're absolutely positively, I can tell you here today, we'll write in the guarantee, you're not going to have illegal dumping in Scarborough. You have a little bit today. We talked about it. It costs $6,000. Okay? After the program, it'll cost $6,000. You have a little bit here and there. Maybe somebody will drive a bag of trash to work, and, and, and there'll be this or that. After a while, people will say, gosh, instead of paying the $1.25 for the bag and having it leak all over my car, I just decided not to do that anymore. So after three, four months, it's like, uh, like after they put the water meters in. Your predecessors who, who made these policy decisions, they never go back. You never dig up the water meters. Yeah, the illegal dumping really is bulky waste, uh, construction demolition. It's not... Correct. Household yeah. waste. Um, but those are those are the two, frankly, the two that I hear, um, and and both of them. You know what's what's great again about this situation is you're not in a budget crisis where we have to add this revenue. You can have a thoughtful discussion with people about the choices that you make. If you have to add uh, to the mill rate and you have to pass a new tax, wouldn't it be better to uh, to achieve an environmental objective, to achieve a financial cost savings along with the revenues, wouldn't it be great to achieve some things that maybe are a little bit harder and require a little bit more work, but once you've fixed solid waste, you've fixed it forever. You've optimized it. You've become the best. And, and that's what, again, that's what we're all about. That's what I'm passionate about and our, and our company does every day is to make that process a successful process. I had lots of questions around it, and kind of fun to answer that. But from the time you get the green light to go, once, once you get through all of the discussions you're talking about, you can really guarantee that this program can be up and running in a four to eight week window, is, is really what you're indicating? With communications and all those types of things, is that's about a reasonable time frame? It's not what I would prefer. What would you prefer? I, I would prefer 90 days. 90 days. Very typical is 90 days. And frankly, there'd be no reason to do four to eight weeks here because we could always do a program start in October. You know, you, you can you can you can budget for the benefit in a partial year yeah. and not have to do anything. But, but it's not a year implementation. Oh, it's a, a actually, I, I'm going to tell you that um, again, having watched these things for a very long time, if you had a year to talk about it, it would not be, with change. You're you're better off having just the right amount of communication. So we would hold public meetings after you decided to do it. We'd explain how everything would work. We'd, we'd communicate with the newspaper. We'd make sure that we're well prepared. But you don't want to have a discussion that goes on forever about anything. If you ask people how to do snow plowing for a year, you'd be in a heap of trouble. So such other question was the model that you did. But did you assume the $2 bag that you used as an example or some other number? We did. We used, we used the standard rate structure from Maine. Which is which is around two dollars for a large bag, okay. uh, and and then we also offer a small bag option because you'll have a lot of households here, especially seniors, that will go to one small bag a week, frankly, or less. Yeah. So they're. But that's the local choice. Bag cost. Completely your choice. And last question for me, I always like to understand, as you said, partnerships. Yes. I'd like to understand what is your business model? What's in it? Where do you make the revenue that makes you excited about partnering with? What's, what, so just so we know no. what your interests are. No, it's very simple. And, and the good news about me is, you know, just I make presentations like Kevin to our partner communities. Okay, all of our economics are, are out in the open. We're B Corporation. When a, a city or town decides they'd like to have utility or unit-based pricing and trash, yep. they send out an. They say, what do we need to do that? And and the the big you know pieces of that, as I had listed in the slide. Are, are well understood. This has been going on for 40 years in the United States, become more well understood over the last five years. And you send out an RFP and people respond. So we, we would like to make your bags uh, for the program. Why do we make the bags? Because, and I'm going to just give you a little inside baseball. When you have a pay as you throw program, you can have something that achieves this incredible objective of 40% waste reduction, but people want to stuff a lot of uh, in the bag. And so we have actually built our whole manufacturing facility around making 
strong bags from recycled content and making sure we do it in the United States so that you never stock out. And, and we have had programs like a Binghamton, New York, where we've taken them over, programs wildly successful, putting two, uh, actually closer to $3 million back in the city budget every year. But the program failed before we took it over because they kept stocking out of bags. And it was a, it was a, it was a, 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 a a silly thing. So we, we like to make bags. We make a margin on that. And then we have a program management fee. Typically in Maine, everyone knows our pricing. Uh, and, and, it's, um, and it's a nice business. Typically once, we, uh, you know, once we, we contract with the community, they'll rebid every three to five years for the service. And, and we hope to, to re-win the business, if you will. And those, those fees are built in a, like that net number of the year. I calculated your numbers as if we were bidding it today, but one of the other nice things about being where we are as a company is with 800 cities and towns, I actually, for example, resin prices vary, but you don't want to have your, your budget vary, so I actually hedge plastic resin for all my cities that are under contract so that we smooth out your costs over a five-year term. There are no negative surprises. It becomes predictable. You know, frankly, we just have this down to a science, so uh, it's, it's um, happy to, to share more with you about the specifics. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on Councilor Donovan. Um, I don't look at this as being currently free, and now they're going to be paying for it because nothing's free. Uh, right? It's how they're billed. Right now they're billed for it through their tax bills, and they don't really see the impact of solid waste. Now they're going to actually be paying for it when they go through the grocery line. Mm -hmm. It's just simply a, a billing mechanism and it's about convenience. And it's that change that really makes everyone nervous. Um, although I think that, personally, I think that um, Scarborough may be somewhat receptive um, if we really show them the outlook and what the benefits are to the community because I know that when the recycling program on the curbside first came out, there was a lot of skepticism. And then our numbers skyrocketed once the education and the outreach and the implementation happened. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm actually excited about this. Um, I want to say thank you very much for coming in. I really do appreciate it very much. I think this is very informative. What I do want to ask of the, of the Finance Committee is to sit on the information that we received. I do think it would be prudent for us to provide some direction to the manager by our next meeting on whether to move forward with this and make it as a recommendation to the council or whether we simply table it for a year or, or what do we do with this um, so that uh, he can sure. know where to kind of go with our budget because there is a significant impact. I mean, $650,000 in year one nearly pays for, it's $100,000 short of paying for the municipal solid waste piece. And in, I think I was roughly calculating in two years you'll pay for all of our solid waste, let alone the benefit of getting on the shipping sites. So um, there's a significant economic advantage, especially as we're looking at Everything else, I mean, 1.2 million dollars being cut by, or 1.1 million dollars being cut by the state on schools. Uh, we need to find those alternative revenue sources. Yeah, and there's middle of the road options. I, I know we're thinking yeah. budget start up ideally for the next fiscal year, July 1. As was mentioned, we can do a, a delayed start. You know, nine, get nine months of enjoyment, start at September 1st or something like that. Uh, if we need more time to talk yeah. about it and ease into it, uh, we can book those numbers in the budget, but they don't need to start July 1st, magically. Just the other piece I want to leave you with, uh, the way we, because it's, uh, all of these costs are supported through general taxation, there are certain classes of taxpayers that don't enjoy the benefits of curbside. Commercial industrial clients do not. So to the extent they are helping subsidize those of us that are. Uh, there's other classes of residential uh, customers that don't. Uh, some, most condominiums. Uh, and also uh, some folks that live on private ways, um, not, not on public streets. So those classes of taxpayers, if you will, are helping pay for this curbside. And uh, those that will enjoy this pay as program or that we, we would force to be involved, and I suppose we would pick up the um, private way folks uh, and, and uh, condominiums, which we don't we don't have at this point. I think there may be some additional benefits mm -hmm. to enhanced recycling and cost avoidance um, um, that may not be factored into these models because we've got some, we've got a fairly large number of folks that fall in those classes that are outside of the curbside program that would be pulled in as part of this potentially. Yeah, that just needs a lot of discussion.
discussion to, for all of us to understand mm -hmm. what those implications are. Uh, that to, I heard what you said, doesn't mean I processed what you said. Yep. Well, that's why I wanted to plant the seed and we can, we can talk further. Great. Good. Um, moving on, our next item is future agenda items, uh, dates and times. Just want to confirm, I believe our next meeting is August. Um, so March, um, is it March 25th? 25th. Right? Right? Yep. And it's at uh, 4 o'clock. I did want to ask, um, so in speaking, or I saw an email, I didn't really get a chance to speak, but Tom's been doing all the follow-up. Um, the county commissioner, uh, Jameson, is actually busy until about 4 o'clock. So I wanted to ask the finance committee if it's possible if we can change our start time to 4.30 sure. so that the commissioner could be here with the county manager to talk about county government and uh, their budget and impact of Scarborough, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Good. And, um, so the topic will be county government, and I do want to ask um, if it's convenient for the committee to, to um, kind of close up this conversation on the page you throw and give some direction to the manager uh, by an action item and decision. Um, so that uh, we know where we're going with that. But it gives you some time to do our own research and follow-up questions and, you know, maybe gauge uh, community members that we have uh, in mind that give us advice. That's good. The, the other side. Yeah. 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 Might I suggest you stay at four and we'll put that first. You can dispense sure. with that Next before the county gets there. That's fine with me. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. We'll do that first. Good. Very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else for the good of the town? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Um, all in favor? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.